The chi-squared test of independence, just like one and two sample z-test for proportions, depends on having a large sample. So when we talk about having the expected cell counts being greater than five, that means that we have a large enough sample such that we would expect at least five observations in each cell. When the expected cell counts are small, however, any of those cell counts um, means that the sampling distribution of chi-squared may not actually, or chi-squared observed, may not actually follow the chi-squared distribution. And we'll see this with uh, this following example. So this example is based on good and bad perceptions, and these data are also available on ELC. Student researchers were interested in how the phrasing of a question affects people's responses. In particular, they asked some students whether they were having a good year and other students whether they were having a bad year. So the phrasing is either positively worded, are you having a good year, or negatively worded, are you having a bad year. The student researchers then recorded whether each student, that is each participant, indicated they were having a positive or negative perception of their year. So please identify, pause this video and identify what is the explanatory variable and what is the response variable. In this case, the explanatory variable is the question wording. It has two levels, good or bad year. The response variable is the student perception. It also has two levels and that would be a positive or negative perception. So here we've got our explanatory variable on the rows and a response variable on the columns. We see that 18 students were asked whether they were having a good year and 12 students were asked whether they were having a bad year. Of the 18 students who were asked if they were having a good year, 15 responded that they were having a positive 15 responded a positive perception, and three responded with a negative perception. Of the 12 students who were asked if they were having a bad year, four responded positively, and eight responded negatively. <coughs> we could use uh, these data to find our expected counts. So I'm gonna ask you to pause this video and calculate the expected counts for these data. Remember, we would have to find the overall p hat uh, for these uh, values to find the expected counts. These are the wording and perception data that are available on ELC. As we saw in the contingency table in the notes, 15 of the people who were asked if they had a good year gave a positive perception. Three of the people who were asked if they had a good year gave a negative perception. Four people who were asked if they had a bad year gave a positive perception, and eight of the bad year people gave a negative perception. We're going to run a chi-squared test, or we're going to get a contingency table using this frequency table. To do this, we go to Analyze, Fit Y by X. We can use Fit Y by X because we have two categorical variables, one response and one explanatory variable. Our response, remember, is the perception of the year, so we can put perception in the Y box. The wording we identified as the explanatory variable. Because we do not have one row for each student or each participant in the data set, and instead we have a frequency table, we have to put the count or the frequency in the frequency box. If we did not do this, as we saw in our previous video, we would end up with an incorrect uh, tabulation of our data. We now have our mosaic plot, and we can see that because we have an unequal number of students who were asked if they had a bad year and a good year, the widths of these bars are unequal. We see that a higher proportion of the sample were asked if they had a good year or a bad year, and that's consistent with what we saw in the data. There were 18 students who were asked if they had a good year, and 12 students who were, if they asked if they were, had a, who were asked if they had a bad year, so the good year bar is proportionally larger than the bad year bar. What we are interested in is the relative heights of these bars. We want to know if there's a relationship between 
what group they are in, good year or bad year, or the phrasing they had, and the proportion of whether they had a positive or a negative perception. We can see that the proportion of students who are in a bad year and who replied a negatively with a negative perception is much higher than the proportion of students in a good year box who replied with a negative perception. This is, a this is a large relative change in the probabilities, and so we have some visual evidence of a relationship between the wording of the phrase and the perception of their year. What we are interested in now is getting our expected counts. The contingency table that JUMP automatically provides does not have an expected count, so we have to get that for, us, uh, for ourselves. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of the total, the column, and the row percentages, as I showed how to do in the previous video, and I'm going to keep the raw counts and get the expected counts. What we see here is that for those who were asked if they had a bad year and provided a negative perception, we only have 4.4 observations expected in that group. The other three groups are fine. There are 7.6 students expected in the positive uh, perception if they were asked if they had a bad year. If they were asked if they had a good year, we expect 6.6 .6 responses in the negative perception group. And if they were asked if they had a good year, we have 11.4 students expected in the positive perception category. However, because there is one cell that has fewer than five expected responses, we cannot uh, the chi-squared contingency, or excuse me, the chi-squared sampling distribution is not going to be appropriate. But we're going to conduct a simulation study to see just how bad this is. So coming back to our notes, we see at least one group has an expected count less than five. And in fact, it's only exactly one group that has an expected count less than five. All the other groups were satisfied. All the other groups had expected counts greater than five. And so we're going to see how bad even having one cell less than five throws off our distribution. So how could we design a simulation study to model the null hypothesis? Remember, our null hypothesis is that there is no association between wording and perception. That is, it does not matter how we phrase the question, students are going to reply whether they had a positive or negative year, a positive or negative perception of the year, uh, independently of the phrasing of the question. So it does not matter if we ask if they have a good year or a bad year, students are going to reply um, true to their actual perception of the year. So how can we design a study or a simulation that models this independence? Well, we can do this just like we did with the Frank sign data. So let's say we have 19 blue cards to represent the 19 people the 19 positive responses regardless of the question wording. And we'll have then uh, 11 green cards and that will model the 11 people who responded in a negative way. So these will be our positive responses and these will be our negative responses because we had a total of 19 positive and a total of 11 negative responses. We will shuffle these cards well and deal into two piles. How big should those two piles be? Should those piles be 19 and 11? Should those piles be 15 and 15 because there were 30 total respondents? Should those piles be 18 and 12 because 18 people were asked if they had a good year and 12 people were asked if they should have a bad year, if they had a bad year? What sizes should those two piles be? Those piles should be sizes 18 and 12. 
the size of the explanatory variable groups. We have our response groups. We need to split them up independently into our explanatory variable groups. There were 18 people who were asked if they had a good year. There were 12 people who were asked if they had a bad year. So we need to get groups of those sizes. So we have our 19 positive people, our 11 negative people. We're going to shuffle them up. We're going to mix them well. And then we're going to randomly divide them up into sizes of 18 and 12. By doing this, we are breaking any association. This is that random assignment. This model's random assignment that we had in the original study. Right? And so now, when we do this over and over and over again, we should have this representation of independence. We can now get our chi-square, our contingency table, and calculate the chi-squared statistic for this sample or for the simulated sample. Because we've broken the association, because we've randomly distributed 19 and 11 up positive and negative perceptions, this chi-squared statistic should be pretty close to 1, or pretty close to the degrees of freedom, which is 1. We're going to do this over and over again. We will repeat. We should do this about 1,000 simulations. So we will shuffle up and deal 1,000 times. So we will have 1,000 total chi-squared simulation statistics. And then we will plot them. That's what this plot over here is. So I have here 1,000 chi-squared statistics. So each of these bars represents a frequency of chi-squared statistics. So this is the distribution of my simulated chi-squareds. So if I were to do this over and over and over again, if I were to deal out these blue cards and green cards into groups of 18 and 12, uh, 18 and 12 I would have a lot of chi-squareds here, and I would have few large chi-squareds around 8. But what we're seeing is that we've got big gaps. This does not look like the chi-squared histogram that we should have seen and that we did see when we had first introduced the chi-squared distribution with Frank's sign. We should not have these big gaps. This blue curve, the blue curve, is the true chi-squared distribution. And we see that it doesn't fit very well. The blue curve is underfitting this uh, simulation model. And so because we have these big gaps, because that blue curve is not fitting what we've actually simulated very well at all, this is not an ideal model. What we would like to see in a simulation is that what we get under simulation is what we would expect in the long run under the theoretical model. So we can get an estimate of our p-value. So in this case, our estimated p-value is that we have 11 chi-squared simulation statistics out of 1,000. So that gives us a p-value of 0 0.011. In theory, if we were to do this, if we were to get our chi-squared from jump, which we have here, our theory-based chi-squared value is 0 0.0054. So 0 0.0054 and 0 0.01 are very different. And that's because the chi-squared distribution is a bad fit for the sampling distribution for this. And we can see that graphically because we have all of these gaps. Ideally, we would have a whole bunch of chi-squareds in those gaps as well. And that just didn't happen. This is because 
one cell, just one cell, had less than five expected counts. So our theory-based model did not fit. So our theory-based model says use the chi-squared distribution. And that gave us a very different p-value than we got under simulation. So what we should do instead is use Fisher's exact test. Fisher's exact test says, hey, when your sample size is small, the p-value is exact. It is correct. The theory-based model, the chi-square distribution works, but the p-value is an approximation. So that's why when the sample sizes get bigger and bigger and bigger, our p-values get better and better and better. They get more and more accurate, but they're not exact because they're really just approximations. Fisher's exact test says the p-value that I'm going to give you is exact. This is actually what it really is. This is the exact probability of obtaining a test statistic like this or bigger if the null hypothesis is true. But Fisher's exact test only works for two by two tables. Now, I will say that if you have Jump Pro installed, which you should, you can, there are exact test alternatives for bigger tables. So if you have a three by two test uh, table, like we saw with the sham acupuncture data, and we needed an exact test, there are options available there. It's just not Fisher's exact test. They are extensions or modifications to the same idea. And what they actually are, are non-parametric alternatives. But we're not going to have time to get into those uh, ideas in this uh, semester. So what Fisher's exact test is doing is saying, what is the probability that we get less than or equal to 7 or more than 15, or at least 15? And the reason why it's looking at 7 or 15 is because 15 is the top left entry in our data table. So the first entry in our data table is all that we need, and this is because it's a two by two cell. When we have all of these row totals, so if it's 15 and the total is 19, then we know that the next entry has to be four. And if the t row total is 18, and we have this entry of 15 here in that first cell, then we know that the next entry has to be three. So the only piece of information that we need, if we have the number of rows and we have the number of columns for two by two table, um, and we have the row and column totals, then all we need is that first cell entry. So we only really need that one piece of information and everything else is determined. So Fisher exact test really only cares about this 15 and it gives us a much closer p-value than we saw uh, before in our simulation. So this is our exact test. The nice thing about jump is that when you run a two by two table, Fisher's exact test is provided. We want the two tailed test. So this is where that 0 0.0086 comes from. Because a chi-squared test for independence is just saying they are associated or not, or excuse me, they're independent or not independent, that is the null hypothesis is that there is no association or there is, the alternative is two-tailed, and so we always look at the two-tailed uh, alternative or the two-tailed p-value for Fisher's exact test.